can get a lot more detailed information too about some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight. We do have some demonstration and research gardens around the county and um, we ha didn't have spring garden market last year because of COVID, but we'll see what happens next year. <laughs> and we have a lot of talks and classes and that. Okay, next slide. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna say a few things about cultural practices that you can do in winter for your fruit trees. One of the important things is to clean up and dispose of old leaves and twigs and mummies. Now you might say, what's a mummy? <laughs> well, we call a mummy in fruit talk, um, um, it's kind of a dead fruit that might be rotten or it might have had a disease still hanging on a tree or it could have fallen off to the ground. So if you see the, any of these, there's a picture on the lower left side of your screen, what we call a mummy. If you see, especially this had, this was a peach tree and had, um, it had brown rot, the peach got brown rot. If this falls to the ground or stays on the tree, there are thousands and thousands of spores, fungus spores that are in the vicinity so your chance of getting reinfection is pretty high. So you wanna clean these up, either put them in your compost pile, if you turn your compost pile, or put them in your green waste or bury them. But yes, please clean up under your trees, all the old leaves and mummies and stuff from last year. Um, then we really recommend mulching. Mulch will turn into compost eventually. And you can use any organic material like shredded tree trimmings from those tree companies, um, bark, pine needles, redwood needles, even eucalyptus chips, they're okay. Um, yeah, any type of bark, that's fine for mulch. If you, compost is really beneficial too, but if you use compost, it can, it can tend to be a little bit hydrophobic. The picture on the right side, somebody's holding a handful of compost, but it's moist. But sometimes if it dries out, it gets hydrophobic and it repels water. So a good idea would be to put your compost under the tree first and then put some mulch on top of it so it holds the compost in place and it won't run off when you water. Um, compost has a lot of really beneficial microbes in it that help roots take up moisture and um, water and nutrients. And some microbes will even kind of hang on to your roots and prevent maybe some diseases from coming in. They're finding out a lot of new things about microbes that are in compost. So composting is very, very good. Mulch will also retain soil moisture and it helps prevent weed seeds from germinating. And on the bottom, you can see a pile of mulch on the picture. Um, you know, again, you can use a lot of different things for mulch. Next slide. Okay, the next slide I think is on mulching, right? <laughs> okay, when you're mulching, you might wanna keep several inches from the crown or the lower tree trunk because there can be some big problems. Um, okay, if you pile up a bunch of, of mulch next to your tree trunk, um, it can start rotting, especially in winter when it gets wet. And by the way, a lot of gardeners and landscapers don't know this, and I see this quite often. Um, one of my friends had a gardener do some work and I was telling her about mulch. So she had mulch delivered and they put it out and they covered all her tree trunks. And I told her, so she had to have them, you know, uh, remove a few inches. So always have a few inches from the tree trunk that's clear of mulch. You don't want to pile it against the, the lower tree trunk or the crown of the plant. Now on the left side, there's a diagram and it shows um, a good a good way to mulch, you know, keep mulch away from the trunk for a few inches or so. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, weed control is also very important. And you can do this in winter and summer. Always keep the crown area or lower tree trunk weed free. In fact, control all the weeds under the tree. <clears throat> weeds can really rob and nutrients and they cover insects and diseases. So you really want to, um, keep the weeds away. And the other thing, weeds can also, especially in winter, if you have a real weedy area next to your tree trunk, your crown or lower tree trunk could stay too moist and you could, it could start rotting. And when the lower tree trunk starts rotting, what happens is you're gonna get fungus that goes into your tree. You're, you could get uh, disease, other diseases and um, you could get insect infestations and borers, things like that. So. You want to, you know, keep the tree trunk free of any, anything. Okay, next slide. 
is I think pruning. Yeah, pruning. Okay, most deciduous tree fruit trees, I don't know, I can't really think of any that don't need to be pruned in winter. Um, oh yes, there are two. There's two fruit trees that you don't prune in winter. You have to prune them, but not in winter. And those are apricots and cherries. So anytime I talk about pruning in winter, apricots and cherries, you prune in summer. The reason why, there's a disease called eutypa. Eutypa can enter through the pruning wounds, especially if it rains within six to eight weeks. So um, cherries and apricots can get this. So you wanna prune them in summer, never in winter. But all your other deciduous fruit trees, you can prune in winter. Now, um, one of the things, even if your tree says semi-dwarf, it really needs to be pruned because even a semi-dwarf tree, if you don't prune it, it can easily get 18 or 25 feet tall. So you prune to con you can prune to control size. You prune out diseased and dead branches, and in winter it's easy to see these or broken branches. Prune out crossover branches, um, and you're going to be constantly pruning every year to for a good scaffold system and and good fruiting wood. All right, next slide. Oh, um, oh, one more thing about pruning that I failed to mention. Um, on the handout, there are some really good YouTubes about pruning. You know what, I'll mention them later, but there's two YouTubes I have on the, on the handout. One is our own, we have a, a master gardener, and he did a YouTube, a seven minute, and it, he really simplifies pruning. And then the other one is through Dave Wilson Nursery, a commercial nursery here in California, but planting new fruit tree, trees. Winter time is really the best time to plant. And your bare root fruit trees are usually available in January or maybe the end of January. Okay, um, next slide. Okay, where to plant new fruit trees? Okay, what you wanna do is look at your lighting, space, soil, drainage, large tree roots. For example, the big redwood on the left if you plant too close to that, if you plant a fruit tree close to that, you're never, it's never going to do much. It might just stay the same size. It might just not hardly ever produce fruit because the root system of large trees is so massive that they're going to steal all the water and nutrients and it's going to be very difficult. Plus, you might not have enough light either. So you need, um, you need to not plant near large tree roots and space is important. <clears throat> okay, one thing I wanna mention about light, you really need about seven to eight hours of sunlight per day in summer. Winter doesn't matter because your fruit trees are dormant. They're not doing much in winter, so it doesn't matter. Most on the right side has a narrow strip between their yard and somebody else's yard. And they do get over seven hours of sunlight in summer, but it's total shade in winter. And that's okay, because deciduous fruit trees, they're dormant in winter, so that's okay. All right, spacing and soil, um, drainage is important. Um, you can plant in clay soil, but you don't want real soggy soil. You don't, you want good drainage. If you dig a hole and the water sits in it for a day and doesn't drain, that's a sign of bad drainage. And you can get root rots, root fungus diseases, if you don't have good drainage. All right, next slide. Okay, spacing trees. Okay, you really need um, about 10 to 20 feet between trees, depending upon the variety. However, um, you may have heard something called high density planting. Okay, it's a way to get more fruit trees in a small space. And a lot of people are interested in this because they have such small yards and they want to get lots of fruit trees in a small space or get more varieties that way. Um, so anyway, this is an idea. Um, this picture on the bottom is at Prush Park and they have a high density apple orchard there and they have like four trees in a hole. What they consider a hole is some, is maybe two, three or four trees in a hole, but this hole might, the trees still might be 18 to 36 inches apart. But it is, I will say, it's difficult to manage. Okay, um, you really, it's really hard to get in there and prune because 
you know, the branches start poking at you and, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult, but you, it can be managed. You're supposed to treat the three, two, three or four trees as one tree and try to prune it like you would one tree. Keep the center very open, keep large branches from going into the but it is difficult to manage. Um, at South County Demo Garden in Gilroy, the Master Gardeners, um, we have a demonstration garden at St. Louis Hospital. And we were in back of the hospital until they made us move because they wanted trailers back there. So now we're on the, in the front of the hospital, but we had a high density orchard, about 28 fruit trees back there. And it was very high density. And the Master Gardeners, we, everybody pretty much complained. It was very difficult to prune the fruit trees because they were so close to each other. I think two in a hole is okay. If you maybe two in a hole that's 36 inches apart is more manageable. But again, it can be done, but very difficult to manage. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, um, this is a, the picture on the bottom is um, a picture of somebody at Dave Wilson Nursery's um, orchard there. Um, they're a commercial grower. They grow a lot of, I'm, I don't want to sound like I'm endorsing them, um, so I'm not endorsing them, but they do have a really, really fantastic website. They're one of the largest growers of fruit trees, and they send their fruit trees to commercial growers or to garden centers. So in January, they start shipping their bare root trees to garden centers. They have a lot of things on their website, like YouTubes about um, two in a hole or four and three in a hole. This guy here, he's, um, he's going to demonstrate pruning, and this is on their YouTube and the Dave Wilson nursery site, and it is on the handout too. But he has three cherries in a hole there. He makes it look at easy. He's standing in the middle of those three trees. But, you know, it, it, it's kind of difficult. Again, it can be done <clears throat> if you keep at it, but you really have to make sure you keep after your pruning. You can't get behind or the branches are going to poke you all over. <laughs> um, so again, you imagine that it's one tree and keep the center open and prune the entire cluster like one tree. So you can go to their website, the Dave Wilson website, and get more information on this. Okay, next slide. Hedgerows. Okay, a hedgerow is a line of trees, either um, a single line or a double line of trees. When you have two trees or two lines in a hedgerow, again, it gets very difficult to prune. Um, one line, and this can be high density too, you know, 36 inch spacing between them, it, it probably can be managed. It probably can be okay. But again, um, it's nice to, if you can space them a little bit further apart, it would be easier, but it can be managed. This could be a possibility if you don't have much space and it's be maybe between you and your you and your neighbor's house, maybe a way to get a few more trees in, in your yard if you do a hedgerow. Okay, next slide. I think next, yeah, we're gonna talk about planting bare root fruit trees. Okay, so um, a lot of times uh, in the nursery or in the garden center, I should say, they get the trees in and sometimes they get the bare root tr fruit trees in from the grower and they immediately put them in pots. And that's okay, they usually use a real cheap soil mix. It might be sand and shavings or something and put it in a cheap pot and you, you buy it at, as a potted plant almost. But you know what? It's still a bare root fruit tree because it, it still was delivered to them bare root and it hasn't done much because it's dormant. It's dormant. So um, that's okay if you get one of these trees. If you get a bare root fruit tree that's not in any package, if they took it out of the sandbox and just you paid for it and you're holding it while you're going home. Um, if, it's, if you get a big week of rain, you may want to find a pot, a cheap pot or something to put it in and put some cheap soil mix in it just to keep the roots moist until you're ready to plant. That might be a good idea because you don't want to plant in heavy clay, soggy soil when it's real wet. So you want to wait till the soil is somewhat friable not real wet and soggy. Um, so when you plant the bare root tree, you want to straighten out the roots. You want to dig a hole about one and a half to two feet wide and about one and a half feet deep and plant on a slight mound. 
Now, if you come back a week after planting and you can see some roots, cover those roots up, but never cover the tree trunk because the tree trunk will rot if it's covered with soil. So you don't wanna do that. Um, another thing about planting bare root fruit trees, don't add amendments or fertilizer. Um, on the UCANR website, which is the second website on my handout in um, the last page of the handout, it will tell you about fertilizing. You fertilize more like in spring and early summer. You don't fertilize this time of the year. But I wanna make a few comments about amendments because so many people, they buy amendments at the garden center or the chain store, and then they put it in the hole and the amendments soil amendments are gonna dry out probably a lot faster than your native soil. And what could happen, you might not even know it's drying out and then your roots will never penetrate into the soil. So that's why we say don't add amendments. Now, if you just hate your clay soil and you're determined you're still gonna add some amendments, please just add a very sparse amount and mix it with your soil before you backfill it. Please don't add just straight amendments because you can have problems later on. Um, okay, okay, um, don't plant too deep. I think I mentioned this, the tree trunk shouldn't be buried. Okay, next slide. Okay, a container tree is different than a bare root tree. A container tree's been growing for maybe six months to a year already. Um, a bare root tree, I think, is a lot better, even if it does come in a container, it's, but it was just put in that container. Um, a container tree, you may have some circling roots in there. You're going to have to take it out of the tree out of the container and um, straighten out the roots. And if they're really circling, you might want to cut some of those roots because they're going to keep growing in circles and you're going to have problems. So straighten out the roots, okay, and then take it out of the container. Um, and backfill again with native soil. Don't add fertilizer or amendments. You can plant slightly above the soil line, as that diagram shows. Yeah, slight, slightly above the soil line. Okay, next slide. Okay, then you can make a little watering basin around the tree. John? Uh, yes? Sorry, uh, we have a few questions uh, regarding earlier uh, topic. So I thought before we move on, can, can we ask those questions first? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, there a couple about mulching. It said, can someone ask, can you put rocks around the base to keep the mulch away from the tree trunk? Uh, I wouldn't use a lot of rocks. Oh, I see. You don't want, because you're afraid they're going to touch the trunk. Um, if they're small rocks, but you don't want that whole area filled with big rocks because they can get real hot in summer. If they're kind of small, small rocks, you could maybe use a few of them. Isn't going to hurt to keep like the mulch away. Rocks. Like a river rock, circle around it was my question. Yeah, I wouldn't put too many in. I would just try to keep, because I'm just afraid if the sun is shining on those rocks in summer, they get really hot and you know that could do fruit trees don't like like to get real real hot especially the trunk of the tree so i would not use very many of them <laughs> use them sparsely but try your best to just keep the mulch away from the tree trunk okay, okay. one more uh, mulching question say why yes. leaves should not be around tree isn't it the way the forests are oh okay um, leaves are okay. Sometimes they even sell leaf mold and stuff in bags at the store, at the garden center. Leaves are okay, but I wouldn't use the leaves that came off of that fruit tree from the year before because they're, especially if there were any diseases or, um, you know, mummified fruit and things because you're going to carry a lot of fungus spores. But if they're shredded leaves that came from, you know, oak trees and that, um, that would probably be just fine. Okay. And also, I, I mean, that's just my question. I, I thought sometimes the leaves can trap the, the moisture when you water them and then that might um, promote fungus growth or something. Okay, but um, mulch, as long as you keep them away, you know, a few inches away from the tree trunk, that's right, right. okay because um, that's okay. All the organic mulches will turn into compost eventually. 
Uh -huh. And even shredded leaves will make a wonderful compost in a short amount of time. But yeah. that's okay because that type of fungus that grows on the leaves is not going to be a fungus that invades your roots. Oh. And it, uh, it will retain moisture under your soil, which is good. And especially when we get hot spells in summer, if the hot sun is shining on your clay soil or your soil and you have no mulch, your roots are going to get warmer. And it's not good to when we have a hundred degree heat spell for your roots to get hot. <laughs> so mulch helps retain moisture and keeps the root system a little cooler. Okay, and we have two questions ar around uh, pruning. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone asked about like the cross, like aprians and pluals, do they need to be pruned in the summer? Like- Oh, aprians, and, okay, yeah, there's a little bit of controversy about that. But a lot of people are saying, wait till, um, yeah, wait till summer. If you want to stay on the safe side, probably do it in summer. But even some of the extension people that we've had, um, Master Gardeners had, had Zoom talks with, we're not really sure about how to answer that question, even that fruit uh, professor we had. So there's, uh, they're not 100% sure, but if you want to play it safe, prune them in summer. Okay. okay. Okay, and, uh, and the second pruning question is, what was the name of the fungus cherry trees might get if you prune in the winter? It's Eutypa, E-U-T-Y-P-A. I'm pretty sure that's it, <laughs> Eutypa. And if you Google that or put it in under UCIPM, the second website on my handout and the back of the handout, um, you know, it'll come up. They have a lot of information on Utypa. I see, okay, thanks. Um, okay, so that's a pruning question. And then there's one spacing question, say 10 to 20 feet for planting from the trunk or between the branches. Can you um, clarify? From, yeah, from the trunk of the tree at least. You know, and it, it depends, you know, on the variety of the tree. And, you know, in the Central Valley, the, even the commercial orchards, they're planting them closer now. So yeah, from the trunk of the tree. But you know what? Um, look at your variety too. See if it says something on the plant tag about your variety or maybe look on the Dave Wilson nursery website because they have every they have a lot of information on every variety of fruit tree. So you can probably get more information there. Okay. Um, okay, there's one I guess is uh, just came in and say there are a lot of bulbs growing around the roots of my fruit tree. Um, oh, moles, did you say? Bulbs, Bitters? sorry, like flower bulbs. Oh. Sorry, bulb, bulb plants. Like, oh. uh, I can't quite tell what kind, and possibly some weird, a weird sort of lily, but I never see flowers, just like these tall, long green leaves. It's some sort of bulb, I'm not sure what. I wouldn't let them grow if they're too close to the trunk. You know, if they're within two feet from the trunk, I, I don't think that would be such a good idea. If they're further away, yeah, if, you know, like daffodils are pretty harmless. They don't really, they're not really going to absorb all your water or, or fertilizer, plus they bloom in spring. If it's a spring bulb that's not, um, not too, too invasive, <laughs> you know, like something like daffodils, if they're a few feet away, it's okay. But I wouldn't let anything grow really close to the tree trunk. Okay. okay, anything else or should I go on? Uh, yeah, I think, yes. Okay, okay, I'll say a few words about watering around the tree. You can make a, like a water basin there. Um, and whether it's a bare root tree or a container tree, you can build a little watering basin there. Um, one important point, you don't want sprinkler, sprinklers to hit the tree trunks. Like if you had rain birds or you used to have a lawn there and the sprinklers are hitting the tree trunks, that's not good. Again, your tree trunk can start to rot if it gets wet like that. So you don't want sprinklers that are sprinkling the tree trunks. <laughs> um, drip irrigation is fine or micro sprinklers that don't hit the tree trunk are okay. And if you use drip irrigation, don't put it too close to the trunk of the tree. You want to put it kind of where the canopy ends, the, where the branches end, because more of the feeder and roots that absorb water are in that space. They're not right next to the tree trunk. Okay. Um, and you can see the 
the right side of the pic the picture on the right side it shows the canopy so where you can see how far the roots will extend someday so the end of the canopy that's where there are a lot of roots that absorb water and nutrients okay next slide all right pruning a new fruit tree um, <clears throat> okay most people don't like ladders so now is the time to start size control and development of fruiting wood, um, except again, in winter, you don't prune apricots or cherries in winter because you need almost seven weeks of no rain. So anyway, you'll, when you get a bare root fruit tree from the garden center, you know, it must be pruned. It'll look like the tree in this picture here. You know, so you definitely want to prune it. Next question, next slide. <laughs> All right, the first year, what you wanna do um, for most fruit trees, take off the top, you know, cut off the head, make a heading cut, cut off the head, <laughs> um, especially if you don't like ladders because really most people like to have a fruit tree that's manageable, that you don't need to get ladders out every single time you do something to that fruit tree. So you, what you wanna do is measure about 18 inches to 24 inches or about knee height and just cut the tree to that size, 18 to 24 inches. Cut the top of the tree, anything above that, cut it off. Okay, then cut the remaining limbs to about two buds. And it's nice if you can find maybe two to four evenly spaced branches there and then cut them and only leave two buds each because this could be your framework or the scaffold branch, branch system of the tree that will last almost forever. Also, be aware of the graft line. Almost all the fruit trees, except some of the, a lot of the figs and pomegranates, but all the stone fruits and um, peach, yeah, stone fruits and pear trees, apples, they're all grafted. So what you wanna do is look at that bud union or graft line there. And if you ever have any, um, any shoots coming up from that root, from the roots, you want to cut them off right away because the top of the tree is different than the roots. The roots were grafted, to, the roots were chosen for health and or dwarfing ability or some other factors. And the top of the tree is chosen for good tasty fruit. So you don't want suckers or this growth coming up from the roots because that can take over and you won't get good fruit then. Okay, next slide. All right, okay, so this again shows a picture of the bud union or the graft union and what you should do. Head back, only leave about 18 to 24 inches from the ground or the soil line to, the, to your tree. Cut off everything else and then just leave maybe two buds or so for each branch and only leave a few branches. Now, if you don't have uh, two to four evenly spaced branches, usually three to four we like, don't worry because there's a lots of hormones and auxins in this tree. And what happens when you make a heading cut off the top, the hormones are gonna accumulate and there's lots of dormant buds in this dormant tree. And it's gonna encourage the dormant buds to produce new branches. So don't worry about it. If you don't have enough branches when you get the tree home and, or after you prune it, don't worry, you'll get more branches. Oh, also, I wanna, um, talk about diagrams in more detail. Um, the UC IPM website, it's the second website on the handout. It's UCANR, or you can go to Google and just put in UC IPM and you'll get the website right away. Um, click on, you get the website, click on home, garden, landscape, fruits, and then click on fruits and nuts, and then click on the tree you're interested in, like say peaches, click on that, and then you have a wide variety of things to pick from. You can click on diseases or you can click on pruning and training. So if you want, this pruning diagram is on that website as well as others. So you can get a real good idea about pruning if you look at this website. Okay, next. Okay, so after your initial pruning, after you planted the tree and, and um, pruned it, it should look like this. And in a few weeks, you might start getting buds breaking. So you can see they left three evenly spaced branches there. And um, 
about two buds on each branch. And this could eventually be the scaffold system, the main branches of the tree. That's your goal that will last maybe forever. <laughs> okay, next slide. Okay, pruning apples and pears. Sometimes apples and pears have this central leader growth habit. So, and this is on the UC a &R website too, these pictures. So sometimes if you want to, you can still cut, cut it off 18 to 24 inches and then leave, um, leave a few more branches, but leave some short stubs with one or two buds each, you know, when you prune. Um, but you, if you can get a, the open vase system on apples and pears, that might be better because of a disease we'll talk about later. Next. <clears throat> okay, painting new fruit trees. If you've ever driven through the Central Valley in winter, you might see a lot of trees out there with white tree trunks. And you're saying, why are the tree trunks white? Well, because they painted them. So it's a real good idea to do this. And the reason you do it because tree trunks can, and exposed limbs can get sunburn, especially on the south or west side of the tree. If you get blazing sun, even in winter, um, what can happen, your bark can crack, your tree trunk or your limb, it can cause cracking. What happens when you have cracking, you can get borers and other insects in there. You can get diseases. It's a, a great entrance for all kinds of critters and diseases. So on the helpline, we often get questions like, oh, my fruit tree, it has borers. Do I need to spray it or what should I do? And if they send in a picture, we might look at especially the west or south side of the tree and we see big cracks. And that's how the insects got in in the first place. So you can prevent this. Um, once you have those cracks, it's gonna be hard to repair the tree. It's gonna be hard to do anything about it. So you can um, get a longer lived tree if you paint. And you should paint with indoor latex paint. Mix it half latex interior paint with half water and use a light color that will reflect the sunlight. And it will help prevent sunburn that causes cracking. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, yeah, okay, the slide on the left is a younger tree and it just shows they painted the tree trunk. On the right side, that's in the Central Valley and you'll see a lot of this when you drive through in winter. So they constantly do this. Um, it's probably a good idea to repaint your trees maybe every year or two to you know look at the tree and see if you're getting new a lot of new um, new growth and if you are you might want to paint it again and winter is a good time to do this because it's easier in summer oh you got all the leaves and everything on the tree in winter it it's a good winter project next slide <clears throat> okay we're gonna go through um, a few characteristics about choosing a new fruit tree um, bare root trees in January are usually a really good choice, and the nursery tag is very important. Now, I talked before about bare root fruit trees. You can get them, some nursery, some garden centers have them just in sand, like the picture on the right. They're just placed in sand, and they pull them out. If you buy it, they pull it out for you, or you pull it out, pay for it, and leave. <laughs> so it's a bare root fruit tree, so it's a good idea when you get home if you're not going to plant it in the near future. Maybe put it in a pot with some cheap soil mix or something um, until you plant it. And hopefully you'll plant it within a few weeks. Okay, the picture on the left shows packaged bare red fruit trees. I don't like to see them packaged too long because if they're too moist inside, they might start rotting. And if the package, it could also dry out actually. <clears throat> so you always wanna keep the roots moist of bare root fruit trees. So if you get it in a package, like the picture <clears throat> on the left, you still might want to pull it out of the package and put it in some cheap soil mix or something until you plant it. Okay, the nursery tag. Keep the nursery tag. Don't throw it away when you get home. Keep it. It has some important information. Actually, I should say you should read the nursery tag before you buy it. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Okay, first I, I'll mention again rootstocks and scions. The rootstock is the bottom of the tree and it's chosen for good roots. And then there's a bud union or graft union, whatever you want to call it. 
and the top of the tree is chosen for good, flavorful fruit. So the scion is the top and the rootstock the bottom. So the rootstock sometimes dwarfing ability, strong roots, disease resistance, whatever. So most fruit trees are grafted. Okay, so always be aware of this. So again, if you ever get suckers coming up from the roots or those shoots coming up, cut them off right away. Next slide. All right, back to choosing a new fruit tree. There are a lot of varieties to choose from, but there are certain characteristics that you might wanna know about prior to purchase. <clears throat> okay, especially if you want fruit. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, first, pollination is really important. So read the plant tag or the, the nursery tag. For example, um, on, this, on this persimmon, I think one of them says self-fruitful, the Fuyu persimmon, they have on their chill hours, how many chill hours you need, <clears throat> and then it says self-fruitful. That means you don't need another tree as a pollinizer tree. However, a lot of the plum trees, some of the apples, um, some of the peaches and nectarines may need a pollinizer tree, another tree, in order to get fruit. So um, I know on Dave Wilson Nursery website, um, they have a lot of this information. And often on the plant tag, you will see um, recommended pollinizer trees, like maybe a certain plum that you're looking at. It might say um, pollinizer could be Santa Rosa plum. And if you buy both trees, um, you'll get fruit on both of them because both of them you know, help each other. Um, okay, there are several ways to solve this problem. If you only wanna buy one fruit tree and you don't have room for another and it needs a pollinizer, um, you could buy a, you could get one of those cocktail, fruit cocktail trees they call them. And sometimes they graft the, actually the grower does this, they'll graft maybe three or four varieties onto one tree so that you don't have to worry about pollination. <clears throat> so you only need one tree. Or you could do some grafting yourself, but I'm not going to get into that tonight. There will probably be some YouTubes or some, um, some sessions on grafting on Zoom. I'm sure in January that's the prime time where everyone talks about grafting. So you could graft different varieties on your tree to get a pollinizer. So that would be um, the solution to that problem. Otherwise, you may need two trees for some of these varieties. So read the fruit, um, the fruit tree label or that tag on there before you buy it, because if it doesn't say self-fruitful, it may say needs to be pollinated by, and they may have some recommendations. Okay, next, um, yeah, next slide. Okay, chill requirement. This is also on the plant tag when you buy it. So if you're really close to the bay, to the San Francisco Bay, you may not get many chill hours. If you're down here in South County, Morgan Hill or Gilroy, you may get lots of, if you're in an inland valley, you might get a lot of chill hours. But chill hours are the number of hours under 45 degrees Fahrenheit during the dormant period before they leaf out. <clears throat> it's listed on the fruit tree label or tag. Chill can accumulate a little bit also before between 45 and 50, but chilling can reverse if your temperature is over 60 degrees. If you get a hot spell in January and it's 70 or 80 degrees, your chilling will reverse. But there's a lot of people questioning chill requirements right now, how accurate they are. So I'd use it as a guide, but just because it says 500 hours, or if it, I'm sorry, if it says 800 hours of chill required <clears throat> and you get 600 hours, you may not really need to worry that much because they are not sure about the data that went into getting the chill requirements. They may be a little bit off, but use it still as a guide. Like if you only get 500 hours a year under 45 degrees, don't buy a tree that requires a thousand hours. So there's a little bit of a leeway there, but don't, <laughs> and this is the other thing, if you order some fruit trees online, you might want to get them from the West Coast because um, chill hours, if you buy them from the Midwest, there are a lot of trees, apples and cherries they have there that require 1,200 chill hours, and we may not get that in our area. Okay, also, apples and cherries usually require the most chill hours. You probably don't need to worry if you're growing figs or persimmons, 
And even there are a lot of apple varieties now that are very low, have low chill hours. So anyway, it's just something to be aware of. <clears throat> Next slide. Okay, um, some of the people who live in inland valleys in the Bay Area or South County inland valleys like myself, if you're in a real frosty area in winter and you get late frost in spring, you might wanna avoid some of the super early varieties, especially apricots. Many apricots are very sensitive to frost after bloom. So if the apricot starts forming a fruit and you get a frost, you can lose your whole crop. Okay, so just something to be aware of if you're in a frosty area. Okay, next slide. When you choose a variety, think about pests. Can you manage the pests? Okay, you have to think about, um, yeah, your variety and kind of research it a little bit. For example, cherries. Birds are a major pest on cherries. And down here in the Morgan Hill area, Andy Mariani has um, some big cherry orchards. And he always says, the only reason I get cherries is because I have so many trees, the birds can't possibly eat that many cherries. But he still uses those metallic streamers on his trees, but you have to put them on right before the fruit is ripe, but not too far in advance and take them off as soon as you pick the fruit or the birds get used to these streamers. <clears throat> And the bird netting, it's, oh, it's hair, horrible to use bird netting, that flimsy stuff. You ask anyone who's used it, trying to get it on and off the tree. So, so birds are something you have to be aware of. You could cage your tree, I guess. But anyway, just be aware. Before you buy a cherry tree, think about um, how, how many cherries will the birds get and how many will I get. Then look at diseases too, not just pests, but look at diseases like fire blight is a major disease on most pears and Asian pears. But we'll talk more about fire blight later, but just think about diseases and how you manage them. Okay, next slide. And when you choose a variety, you think, how much work will it be compared to the yield? How much fruit will I get? Like how much pest control, diseases, insects, critters, and pruning is needed? You know, can I man manage it? You know, so um, so he, these are, you know, plums usually aren't too much work and persimmons are usually really easy. Just some two pictures I put up there. Okay, so we'll talk more about the different fruit trees then. Okay, next slide. And harvest times. Okay, um, this is important too because how much fruit, if you have a bunch of fruit trees and they all get ripe between July 15th and August 30th. How much fruit can you eat? Of course, we definitely encourage people to go to the food banks and take fruit there too, but still you can be really, really busy, you know, between the end of July and the end of August if you plant too many fruit trees that get ripe at the same time. But next slide will show a harvest chart. And I know you can't read any details on this chart, but I put it up here because this is on Dave Wilson Nursery's website. And like the green streak in there, there are all these little rectangles that are green. And it shows apple varieties that get ripe in, Ju in June, July, August, September, October, and even into November. You'll see that green streak that goes through. Those are all apple varieties on the Dave Wilson nursery site, you can see very clearly what varieties get ripe at different, different months and different times. They have harvest dates. So this is something I think important to know because um, for example, I have um, five plum trees in my yard and my first plum tree gets ripe, I think it's a beauty plum and it gets ripe the very beginning of July. And my latest plum tree just got ripe a few weeks ago you know, in um, September, that's uh, an Italian, Italian prune plum. So anyway, it's nice to kind of space them out if you can. Okay, next slide. Okay, now we're gonna talk about a few of the specific fruits, trees that from those that might ripen real early to those that ripen late. And I'll just make a few comments about a few of these trees here. But cherries, they're usually the very earliest deciduous fruit trees. Um, again, the birds, you know, the birds can get them, and they do have another disease. They can get Eutypha disease, um, and there have been some instances of spotted wing Drosophila. It's a type of fruit fly that lays larvae, larvae in the fruit, 
but it's, it doesn't come every year. It seems like it's kind of sporadic. Every few years, people get it, and it does attack cherry trees. And they do have a rather higher, they have a higher chill requirement, but it's usually the earliest deciduous fruit. Okay, next. Okay, apricots. Apricots are probably the next fruit that's available. You know, late spring, early summer, they do get you typa, so you must prune in summertime. Okay, I'm not gonna say too much more. You can get brown rot on apricots too. Okay, next slide. Plums. Plums, um, I, like the cherries and apricots, they're not too hard to prune. Plums aren't too hard to prune either. The pruning, you know, you prune, you can prune in summer, but prune definitely your detailed pruning in winter. There are early and late varieties of plums. They're fairly easy. There aren't too many major diseases on plums. And again, there's early varieties, late varieties, and everything in between. Next slide. Okay, and there's so many varieties of plums. They're really, really, I think, a wonderful fruit tree because there's such a variety to pick from too. <clears throat> okay, next slide. Peaches and nectarines, they are susceptible to peach leaf curl and brown rot. They're early and late varieties. Um, yeah, for peaches, um, they require, you know, the normal amount of pruning, but they might require some spraying for a, for a good crop. <clears throat> they can get peach leaf curl and brown rot. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Next slide. Okay, pears and Asian pears. Okay, they are very susceptible to fire blight. Most of them are, but not all of them. Like the example, Blake's Pride on the left, that pear tree is fairly um, disease resistant. And on the Dave Wilson website, they do say Shinto Asian pears are somewhat resistant to fire blight. So that's something to think about before you choose a pear, a pear tree. Fire blight is a major disease and we'll talk about that too. Next slide. I forgot to say, pears also get ripe a little bit later. Usually pears get ripe, you know, sometime maybe August or late, well, yeah, usually August or September. So they're later. Um, apples, your major problem is going to be codling moth. Not too much you can do in winter about that. Maybe sometimes spraying with the trunk with dormant oil might help. And some apples do get fire blight. You have early and late varieties of apples. Again, on that Dave Wilson nursery chart, harvest chart, you can see there are early apples all the way through October for harvest. All right, next. Okay, figs. Figs are really pretty easy. They're um, very easy. They don't get major diseases. They're pretty easy to prune. Um, you can sometimes get two crops a year. There's what they call the Breba crop. It, it may produce figs like in July and then again in um, September or October. But a lot of times the Breba crop isn't as good as the later crop. Sometimes the Breba crop, the early crop is kind of dried out and maybe doesn't taste as good. We've had a lot of calls on the helpline about that. And sometimes there's not much you can do about it, but the later crop is usually really good. So figs get ripen, ripen later usually. So, you know, it's when a lot of other things are done. Okay, next. Okay, persimmons. Persimmons are wonderful. They get very few diseases or pests, and they're what we call um, an, edible, an ornamental or an edible ornamental because they're so beautiful. They have beautiful fall color and, um, and you harvest them pretty much when all your other fruit is done. Usually late October or November you harvest your persimmons. So it's a real good choice to have and they do so well here in the Bay Area. Okay, next. Okay, pomegranate. This is one of the latest deciduous fruit trees. It will probably get ripe in late November or December. Um, pomegranates are another good edible ornamental tree. Beautiful flowers in summer. Oh, the bees and the pollinators love it. And they don't get many diseases. Probably, again, probably no reason to ever have to spray the tree. But pomegranates require a lot of pruning. They have really aggressive growth, especially inner growth. Gets very, very aggressive. If you don't prune pomegranates, religiously, <laughs> you're going to have a real thick shrub. 
So you have to keep that inner growth pruned out. And it's best to try to do as much pruning as you can um, in winter and early summer because late summer, it gets kind of thorny and it's harder to prune. So that's the only disadvantage I really see on pomegranates. Otherwise, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful tree. Okay, next slide. Okay, there's other varieties too. There's all these hybrids now, like picotum. Okay, that is a peach hybrid, or it's a, a peach with an apricot with a plum. All genetics from all three of those fruits are in the picotum, and nectoplum, nectarine and plum, and aprium has apricot and plum. Pluary is a cherry and a plum. So you've got all these other things to pick from too. So there's a lot of fruit trees to pick from. Okay, next slide. Okay, we're gonna to try to cover some diseases and insect pests now, because so, winter- John, sorry. Before oh, yeah. we move into diseases, um, there are a lot of questions. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, let me see. Start from uh, where we left off. Okay. Um, my old pu'ao tree, Oh, okay, you're going to cover the brown rod, because this is a... Yes, a I am. Brown yes, rod. I, in a few slides, I will, yes. Right, right. Uh -huh. Okay, and um, how can... A, well, there are two questions about chill hours, and yeah. one is, in general, how can a person find out the number of chill hours in, the, in their area, and other ones, how many chill hours are typical in Gilroy? Oh, boy, you know what? Oh, I don't know the name of the website. There is a website that you can go to um, that shows chill. You might want to Google chill hours Gilroy. There are, um, there are weather sites all over the Bay Area where you can find out chill hours. And I don't, I don't know the name of the website right now, but maybe you might want to ask that question to the helpline or just Google chill hours Gilroy or weather station Gilroy and see what you can find out because I know that is available. But Gilroy generally has more chill hours than um, North San Jose or Sunnyvale or that. So Gilroy usually has has more chill hours. Gets more chilly. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, a few questions about pruning. Uh, my nectarine tree is taller than seven feet. Do I prune it all the way to leave only 36 inches? Oh, okay. Um, I think I got misinterpreted here. <laughs> okay. Um, new fruit trees, when you buy a new fruit tree, that's when you want to prune. Um, okay, that's when you want to prune at knee height. You cut it off at the top, knee height or 18 to, you know, 18 inches or 24 inches. But okay, if your nectarine tree is already seven feet, you can start taking the size down. You know what, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later about pruning established trees, but you can take it down. You might wanna start this winter. Um, or what kind of a tree was it again? It's a uh, nectarine. Oh, nectarine, okay, yeah, you can prune those in winter. Start trying to get the height down in winter. Yeah, you might wanna start, um, start pruning the top of it and then take some inner branches. But you know what, I'm gonna give you some concepts to think about later. Okay, so I'll, I'll get to that right after diseases. <laughs> okay, sure, thanks. Uh, okay, and whenever I prune my peach tree, I get very little or no fruit. How can I avoid that? Okay, we don't know if pruning is the reason or there's another reason, but um, when we get to the pruning section, I'll, there are some pictures of fruit buds and where fruit on peach trees is, develops. Okay, so okay. we'll get to that. Hopefully. Okay, and there are uh, several questions about people plant trees from seeds. Uh, one is for um, uh, Africa, uh, planted a pit five or six years ago, and it's a small tree now. Um, any you know, instructions? The only problem is you don't know what the genetics in that tree is going to, you have no idea what it's gonna turn out to be. Right. So that's the only problem. That's why they, the way they propagate trees, um, you know, they take cuttings. They take cuttings so they get the same genetics so that you know, because a tree is a big investment. So um, the growers, the growers, they, they take sterile cuttings and they propagate them and then they graft them onto a good rootstock that will be healthy. 
So that's, so a seed, it's all over the board. I have no idea how it will turn out because those nectarines and peaches are grafted. They're grafted. Sure. So. Uh, another question is about avocado. People, uh, one asks if they can uh, homegrown from a seed. Another one said, I already developed avocado from seed. How do I know which type of pollinators that I should? Yeah, you know yeah. what? You might want to um, go to the helpline and ask that question because um, I'm only talking about deciduous fruit trees tonight and that's an evergreen tree and I'd have to it would take too long to explain that question <laughs> sure, sure. so anyway I'm kind of running behind I think <laughs> okay sorry okay that's okay um, yeah. that's okay ask the question to the helpline go to the helpline and ask that question okay okay so um oh the one question about because earlier you mentioned figs and someone asked can you tell me how to protect uh, have, having worms in figs? Oh boy. Okay, I would go to um, worms. They're getting worms in figs? Yes. Worms? Okay, I would, um, I would go to the UC IPM website and okay. look up figs and see, because there are, too, there are a lot of questions you'd have to, uh, I don't know what kind of worms you you'd have to go to that website and really kind of look at that or else I will, um, yeah, ask I will share the link of IPM with them so um, okay gonna... okay great good okay all right um okay we'll go to the next slide okay we can go to the next slide yeah okay because the major diseases that you can do something about in winter are brown rot peach leaf curl and scale insects and fire blight a little bit. And I did want to just mention spotted wing, Drosophila and Eutypha, just so you're aware of it. You can't do too much in winter about these, but just so you're aware that you don't prune apricots and cherries in winter and spotted wing, Drosophila, that you clean up under your cherry trees and get rid of all the old leaves and stuff because sometimes they overwinter under there. Okay, next slide. Okay, the peach leaf curl. This is a big disease of peaches and nectarines. Rarely, sometimes, but rarely cherries. Sanitation is a good idea. Again, clean up under the fruit tree, get rid of the old leaves um, from last year. You can spray a fungicide in November and again um, before bud break with peach leaf curl. Um, let's see, a common fungicide is copper that you would use. A lot of the fungicides for peach leaf curl contain copper. Um, Later, you can use either copper again or a fungicide containing chlorothalonil. And this is on the UC IPM website. And I, um, ipm.ucdavis.edu. It's the second website on my handout in the back of the handout. And you can get more details on this. Okay, but one thing I do want to mention, when you're spraying a fungicide, really look at the label and follow the directions as perfectly as you can, especially rates and time of the year and the tree that you're using it on, make sure it's on the label. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, the other thing is if you're spraying copper, try to spray the tree, not the soil, because copper can accumulate in your soil. So just spray the tree, not the soil. Okay, next slide. Okay, peach leaf curl, um, it can affect the tree. You see, used to say, pick the leaves off the tree and it, it really doesn't matter. But if, if you don't do anything about it and you have severe peach leaf curl, it can affect the health of the tree. So you may wanna do something about control, but there are some resistant varieties. There's Indian Free, Mir, Q18, White Peach and Frost. And I have the variety called Frost. You still are supposed to spray it the first three years for peach leaf curl, but after that, you don't spray it anymore. And I'm having really, really good luck with my Frost um, peach tree. I don't have any peach leaf curl on it, and I never spray it. Next slide. Okay, brown rot. This is a, a bad fungus disease. It's the biggest fungus disease of peaches and nectarines worldwide, and it can affect apricots and cherries too, but peaches and nectarines for sure. Um, sometimes prunes, rarely plums, but this is where you see the gray moldy fruit or your fruit might start turning brown and rotten, or you might 
pick some fruit that looks pretty good, pretty good peaches, you bring them in the house and the next day you cut them open and you see a brown spot near the pit and it's like rotting and that's brown rot. So it's not good. <laughs> um, it's important that you, like when you see these gray moldy fruit, pick them and dispose of them immediately and only put them in your compost pile if you turn your compost pile or bury them. Otherwise, put them in your green waste because you don't want the spores blowing all over. Next slide. Okay, brown rot. Um, sanitation is real important. Also, twigs. Remove infected twigs. And sometimes you can see these pretty easily in winter time. Like if you see a mummy on a twig, it might be dead. You know, get rid of it. Or on the right lower slide, you see a twig that's sort of dying, just prune it off. You wanna prune those and discard them. So if you do a good job on sanitation, you might have some luck controlling this. Next slide. Okay, um, okay, yeah, like this shows some infected figs. So if you see some sap oozing out, like the picture on the right, right after it blooms, that probably is brown rot. It enters through the flowers, by the way enters through the flowers. Um, there are some things <clears throat> you can spray, some fungicides um, that you can spray. Um, next slide, I think I have this on a slide. <clears throat> okay, but your timing to spray your peach or nectarine um, or apricot, the timing is really important. You have to spray the fungicide at the pink bud stage and again at full bloom. And products containing copper, um, you can only use copper before it's blooming. Once your tree is in bloom, you can't, and the label will say, do not use copper after, at or after bloom. So read the label carefully. There's an uh, active ingredient called myclobutano, and you can use this after you can't use copper anymore. But again, um, read the label because it's very important. Your rate, you wanna be spot on when it comes to the rate. That if it says four ounces per gallon, make sure you measure um, accordingly and um, <clears throat> hopefully it'll help. But again, the UC a &R website is really good. It talks a lot about brown rot and you'll get more detailed information. And if you wanna learn more about the pesticides, there's a link on the left side of that page and you can click on that and get all kinds of information and toxicity and all that. Okay, next slide. There are some brown rot somewhat resistant varieties. There's Harcot and Harglow apricots, Cavalier nectarine. And I did read on the Dave Wilson website, it says that La Feliciano peach is somewhat resistant. So if you've had a problem with this and you're buying a new tree, you might consider this. All right, next. Next slide. Okay, fire blight. Okay, this one affects apples, pears, quince, Asian pears. <clears throat> and by the way, it affects a lot of the ornamental pears that we have on streets and in neighborhoods, and that can spread very easily. A lot of our ornamental pears are dying from fire blight. Um, in summer, you see it when the leaves and branch, <clears throat> you'll see a blackish color or they turn brown suddenly or blackish, almost looks like they're scorched. But in winter, you might also see branches that look blackish or brownish or dead. If you see any of these dead branches in winter, Cut them off be below the infection about 10 to 12 inches with clean pruning shears. Sterilize your pruning shears between cuts. Copper, they say, might be somewhat effective during bloom period, but it's kind of hard to um, it's kind of hard to prevent this. Sanitation is really about the best way right now. Cut off all infected branches. Okay, next slide. Okay, there is something new. There's a Bacillus subtilis. It's a bacterium, a natural product available on the home market. Fire blight's on the label, but it's still more of a preventative. <clears throat> and it is kind of a headache to spray, spray this. Okay, next slide. And by the way, there's more, again, on the UC a &R website. There's lots of detailed information about fire blight. Now, there are some resistant varieties and um, at our demo garden in Gilroy, the master gardener, gardener, we had a lot of problems with our Asian pears. We had, I think, three, three or four of them, and we lost all but one Asian pear. There's only, we think Shinko might, or they, I don't know, some people think, Dave Wilson Nursery thinks Shinko might be somewhat resistant for an Asian pear. But here are some other varieties, Hudson's Golden Gem Apple, 
is supposed to be very resistant against fire blight. Um, Warren Pear, Blake's Pride, and Harrow Delight. These three pears, I happen to have all three of them, and they're over 10 years old. I haven't seen any fire blight. Some of my friends have some of these varieties too. We haven't seen fire blight on them yet. So hopefully they'll be good and resistant. And they're all very good tasting pears too. So, um, so fire blight, a lot of times the University of California will recommend resistant varieties for your first line of attack. You know, next they'll say next time you plant a new plant, even tomatoes or whatever, they really highly recommend resistant varieties. Um, let's see, what else about fire blight? Okay, Asian pears, yeah, a lot of them are very susceptible. Oh, one other thing, pink lady apple is also an apple variety that's very susceptible to fire blight. So if it's been in your neighborhood or you've lost any pears or apples to it, you might not want to plant um, pink lady apple. <laughs> okay, next slide. Okay, scale insect. This might be something you see in, in, in winter on your trees. Um, there's San Jose scale, when San Jose was all apricot trees, and there's some other scale insect problems. Um, if they're, they look like little bumps on twigs or branches of trees, you can puncture them with your fingernail. If you're not sure what they are, see if you can puncture them. But anyway, they might be scale. Um, you can spray horticultural oil, just read the label and read the UC website on the details on this, but I just want you to be aware of this. And especially if you start seeing a lot of ants crawling on your tree, that may, may be an indication you might have scale or some other insect pests. Next slide. Okay, scale insects, um, sometimes controlling the ants is a good way because the ants protect the scale insects. They also, I know on this slide, I have aphids because aphids and scale insects and mealybugs and white flies, they produce honeydew, this sticky, sweet substance that ants love. So they protect these pests. And if they see any um, beneficial insects that are gonna eat these pests, they, they attack the beneficial insects, like the parasites or, par um, parasites or predators of these. So sometimes if you get rid of the ants, you control the ants, um, the beneficial insects will take care of your scale insects. So anyway, there's a product you can use called Tanglefoot and you put it on stretchy material and wrap your tree. Um, and it's a sticky material and the ants get stuck in it when they crawl up the tree. So that's one way, or you can use baits. But if you use this Tanglefoot stuff, wear disposable gloves because, oh my gosh, um, you're, everything sticks to everything. So wear old, old clothes and disposable gloves. It's kind of difficult to work with because it really sticks to everything. Next slide. Okay, plum gall mite. This is a new one, just to be aware of it. Um, it recently became a problem in a few areas last year. It looks like enlarged buds, but it's really a mite. And there's larvae inside of these, what look like large buds. Now, um, it attacks plum trees. We haven't seen a lot of damage from this yet, but the next slide, um, oh, I'm not sure if it's on the next slide. Anyway, what you can do is, I'm sorry, I should have said for plum ball, plum gall mite, one of the um, things you can do is spray a wettable sulfur in March. I think it's in March. They recommend spraying wettable sulfur in March, maybe April, March to April, and you can get rid of this. Okay, next slide. Okay, spotted wing drosophila, I think we mentioned this before. The fruit fly lays eggs in the ripe fruit and you're gonna get all these quite little larvae or little worms inside your fruit. Sanitation is very important, like this time of the year, again, clean up under your fruit trees. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, you can read about this on the UC a &R website. So I just want you to be aware of it. Okay, next slide. Okay, so again, if you want to learn more detail about these pests and diseases, I know we're trying to cover so much tonight, but you can go to the, um, the, the ipm.ucanr.edu website and then just click on home garden, turf landscape, then click on fruit trees, then click on the fruit tree you want to get information on, and then you'll see diseases or pests or training and pruning. Okay, so the next part, next slide will be 
a little bit on pruning, and I know I don't have too much time left, and I still want some questions, but I'm going to run through this fairly fast. I'm just going to talk about maintenance pruning for trees over a year old. You can see in the Central Valley, see these fruit trees, they have a lot of kind of wide angled branches. Go to the next slide. Okay, so what you want to do after the first year, you want to create strong scaffold branches. So the tree on the left, you can see the inner side of the tree, there's not too many branches. You prune out, you let the light penetrate the inside of the tree and almost have a vase shaped tree. On the right side, it shows a diagram of the tree. These are on the UC website, by the way. What you want is wide angled branches, not narrow branches. Next slide. Okay, so you want a, an open center vase shaped tree. You can see the tree in the square there. You can see what they're going to prune off with the dots there. It's going to be a vase shaped open center tree because you want light to penetrate the tree. You want wide branches and you always have to do maintenance pruning so you get new, new fruiting spurs and all that. So, you, so next slide. Okay, training apples and pears. If you can train them as a modified base system, that's good, but sometimes they tend to grow like a central leader. So the pr pruning on the right side is okay too. And these pictures are on the website, so I'm not gonna talk any more about this. Next slide. <laughs> okay, this just shows, I like this slide because on the left side it shows a nursery grown tree and then how do you prune it? The correct pruning is on the top and the bad pruning, incorrect pruning is on the bottom. You're gonna get a, a tall tree with narrow branches that can break easily. So you want, you want the top tree, not the bottom tree. Okay, next slide. Okay, just another picture showing an open vase system. And again, I'm not gonna get into detail, but you have to think of the concept. Prune a lot of the inner growth out, leave a few main scaffold branches, and you know some horizontal branches that come off of the scaffold branches. Next slide. Okay, this is incorrect pruning that can lead to breakage. This tree was actually in my yard and it didn't last long because I didn't prune it properly. I let a very narrow angled branch I love that branch and I thought, oh, I can't prune that off. And then I also didn't thin it properly and that narrow angled upright branch broke and took part of the trunk with it. So this tree had a short life. Next slide. Okay, crotch angles. When choosing what to keep and what to prune off, consider if it's a wide crotch angle or a narrow crotch angle. The one on the right is a good branch angle, it's wide and it will be a much stronger branch attachment. The one on the left, that one you would want to prune off. Prune that off. Anytime you see that kind of growth, get rid of it, prune it off. Next slide. Okay, established, somebody asked about established um, nectarine tree that was too tall. Okay, look at the picture on the right upper side, what they're gonna take off of this tree. Um, they're gonna, they're going to really start reducing the height of this tree and they're going to take that top off and they'll probably prune a little bit more off. And you can do this, you know, long term every year. Um, the bottom tree shows a narrow crotch angle. You definitely want to take that off. Um, that bottom right tree has a nice um, wide crotch angle on the left side. That you'd want to leave on. And these, these are on the UC website. Next slide. Okay, pruning established apples and pears, they have spurs, they bear on fruiting spurs. And the fruiting spurs, they have little rings around them and they're kind of stubby. Okay, so most of the fruit is on three to five year old fruiting spurs. They're the most productive. And you can prune out the old spurs. How do you tell an old spur? The picture on the left looks really like a healthy younger spur, so you'd want to leave that. The middle picture, that right fruiting spur, looks kind of old and dark. If they get dark and thick and have lots of rings around them, you want to prune some of those out. You want to prune them out. And also, it will rejuvenate new, you know, you'll get new fruiting wood too. You always have to do some pruning to get rid of the old spurs and you'll get new ones then. Okay, next slide. Okay, peaches and nectarines. 
flower buds of peaches and nectarines develop on one-year-old shoots. So um, I'm not sure if, if you're pruning, there was a question earlier, if you're pruning too much, usually people don't prune too much out. There might be another reason why you're not getting fruit. I don't know if your tree is blooming well every single year, if you see lots of blooms on the tree, it might be a pollination problem too. Um, so anyway, but on the bottom there, you will see before pruning and after pruning pictures. And this is on the UC website. It just kind of gives you an idea. Now, if this tree was in my yard, the after pruning, that tallest branch, I would prune that out because this is probably a commercial orchard and I want um, branches that aren't, that just looks too tall for me. And you could bring that branch way down if you wanted to. And again, you could give the same tree to three different people. It could be pruned three different ways and it all could be correct. So don't get scared of pruning. But um, look at the YouTubes on pruning. There's a YouTube on our website that's only seven minutes and there's some really good ones on a, uh, established trees and new trees and everything on the Dave Wilson website. And theirs is really good too. So, and you'll probably find some more, you know, some more YouTubes on the web, but definitely go to ours on the Santa Clara Valley Master Gardener website. <clears throat> okay, next slide. Okay, this just shows how fast fruit trees grow. So, you know, if you make uh, some mistake on pruning, usually you can eventually correct it. So these are one and two year old peaches in a commercial orchard. Just look how fast they grow. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> this just gives a, I picked these slides because it shows the scaffold system. Those main branches that are gonna stay there almost forever. <clears throat> They're somewhat wide angled branches, sturdy branches, and not too many of them. The tree on the right bottom side is really nice wide angled branches. That's gonna be a great fruit tree. Okay, so you can just get an idea. I think the more pictures you look at, you can kind of get an idea of what the fruit tree should be pruned like. And these trees were severely pruned, the ones that are blooming, and look how many blooms are on. People are always scared they butcher the trees. Don't worry about it. Um, usually, you, you, usually you will not do that. <laughs> Next slide. <clears throat> okay, pruning plums. Uh, most flower buds <coughs> on plums and prunes. They're on spurs. <clears throat> okay, so plums and prunes, they're pruned similar to the others before. <clears throat> Losing my voice here. Okay, but anyway, again, the pictures give you an idea of what to prune off. <clears throat> These are all on our website. <clears throat> okay, next slide. Okay, pruning figs. Um, they're pretty easy. Again, these same pictures are on some other, <clears throat> would apply for some other fruit trees also. Okay, next. Okay, pomegranates. You wanna remove the suckers because they tend to sucker a lot coming up from the roots, crossing branches and inner growth. One thing about pomegranates, they need a lot of pruning. If you don't prune them, you're gonna get a really thick shrub and you won't get as much fruit. So the open vase method is really good. Keep the tree fairly open, prune a lot of the inner growth out and keep the tree to a desired height. Prune off anything you don't want that's too high. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, persimmons. They're very similar to other fruit trees. You know, keep the center somewhat open. Prune off those long branches. <clears throat> persimmons form on current year's growth, so you don't have to worry too much about, about pruning. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, I want to say a few words about espalier. Um, we can't get into this in detail because our time is almost up, but um, there are a lot of websites on this and it works really well for pears and apples, <clears throat> especially if you have a really narrow space and you don't have much, much room. In France, they do a lot of espalier. Okay, next slide. Okay, a lot of the commercial orchards are starting to go with espalier because it's a space saver and it's so easy to pick the fruit. So this shows on the left and the right <clears throat> after they're leafed out. So um, espalier, um, they're starting to, to sell some of the trees already espaliered. And in France, they've been doing this for years. Okay, so next slide. 
So I hope you enjoy some fresh fruit and hope you're successful with growing some deciduous fruit trees. And next slide. Okay, so just remember, we have a really good website, um, mastergardeners.org. And again, you can ask your questions that didn't get answered tonight or go to garden help. Okay, and last slide. <clears throat> okay, so thanks a lot for coming. And we, we have maybe time for a few questions here. <laughs> Sorry, I know there's so much to cover, but that's why I really emphasize the last page of the handout um, because I wanna give you some good references to go to to get more detail because fruit pruning, geez, there's classes that are, you know, a year long every week on fruit, on fruit pruning or uh, fruit diseases and things like that. So there's a lot to cover. Okay, Emily, you have some yes. questions? Um, yeah, someone asked like, could you cover uh, a little bit about the pruning tools? Um, or uh, I remember seeing some information on our MG website, but right now I, at this moment, I can't find it to yeah. share. Yeah, okay, yes, you know what? Go to our website and go to the YouTube the seven minute YouTube, it says, it's Alan Baczynski. He does um, a YouTube on pruning and it, winter pruning, it's seven minutes. And I think he actually explains like, this is a lopper. I thought he did anyway, I think it's that website. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, that's the same one that yeah. I saw, something about okay. the difference between the bypass. Uh, yeah. Versus something, yeah, yeah, definitely is there. Let me find that YouTube uh, link and share with everyone. Um, and also, okay, I, think I, think I, I might have it on the handout. I think I do. YouTube winter pruning, Santa Clara County Master Gardeners. It's okay. the second last one on the on the handout. Okay, okay. And another person asked um, about if they have, can they plant another fruit tree if the previously there was one that severely uh, attacked by the brown. Uh, oh, brown rot. Yes. Yes. Yeah, fruit trees, um, usually they don't get root diseases that are gonna stick around in the soil. Um, <clears throat> just make sure the soil is well drained. If you, have, if you have good, if your soil drains real well, if you don't have puddles of water sitting around for a long period of time, there should be no reason why you couldn't plant another fruit tree in that spot. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, let me see. And it is almost 8.30, so I don't know if you want to do a few more questions and... Um, okay, we'll maybe, yeah, maybe one or two, one or two more. Otherwise, um, we welcome you to, to go to the helpline, our mastergardeners.org website and ask your questions there. Okay, uh, so just one, one more. Uh, uh, okay. Someone mentioned that uh, she missed your suggestion about how to keep the birds away. Can you please... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, there are several things. Sometimes people actually put a cage around their entire tree. I've seen that. The netting, that flimsy netting. I hate to suggest that because everyone, including myself and everyone I know who's used it, hates it. And other critters get stuck in it and might die. Critters that you don't want, like your cat or something, might get stuck in it if it, it blows all over the place. So I don't know that, um, that flimsy netting. I, I'm not sure I would suggest that. But um, sometimes the bird stream, those streamers, those metallic looking streamers help a little bit. If you put them on right when the fruit is getting ripe and take them off as soon as you pick the fruit, that might help a little bit. But probably caging or protecting the tree is, yes. I hate to say it, but that's probably the best solution. Okay, yes. One of my friends told me that the, the best solution for her is her dog. <laughs> oh, okay. That's a good idea. <laughs> yes, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I okay. Uh, does the olive trees need trimming? If yes, when? Oh, I didn't even I didn't cover olive trees because they're not they're not deciduous fruit trees. Um Yes, you do. Okay, but I will say, yes, you need to prune olive trees. And that's an entire subject by itself. But on the UC website, they do have a lot of, U, University of California has so much research on olive trees and so much information. Definitely go to the UC a &R website. You'll find out more than you ever wanted to know about olive trees and pruning them. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Well, yeah, it's 8.30, so we just okay. uh, um, be aware of everyone's time and want to thank you.